Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, welcoming in you to this edition of Revealing the Truth with our good friend Carl Gallup. He's the author with Zev Parat of The Rabbi, The Secret Message, and The Identity of Messiah. He's also the best-selling author of Gods of Ground Zero, Gods and Thrones, Nahash, Forgotten Prophecy, and The Return of the Elohim. When the Lion Roars, Understand the Implications of Ancient Prophecies for Our Time, Gods of the Final Kingdom, and his latest book, Masquerade, Prepare for the Greatest Con Job in History. He's the senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church since 1987 in Melbourne, Florida, and an Amazon Top 60 best-selling author, a conservative talk radio host, heard nationally and internationally since 2002. You can find him at Carl Gallup's Dot com. He's here with us on the second Monday of every month at the 12 o'clock hour for the Carl Gallup's Hour. So without more introduction, I want to welcome in my good friend Carl Gallup. Carl, so good to see you. Rabbi Eric, it's good to be back with you, my brother. Thank you for your kind words. I've missed you. I've missed you too. Yeah, I was telling you right before we went on the air, I thought maybe the rapture had come and you had gone and I was left behind, brother. I, I was beginning to worry. Well, I went uh, around the corner looking for you. As a matter of fact, I've, I've spent more time with your son uh, in the last two months than I've spent with you. No, I know. He's a great guy, and uh, he loves you, loves this program and your audience. And uh, the Lord's really gifted him with an amazing ministry. I, it's just, man, that ministry is booming and growing. It's crazy. Yeah, but the Lord's really blessing. You know, in, in uh, it's a small world when your son has two of my dearest friends she she been she's the woman who heads up is the women's part of the addiction program Sean uh, Hazelrig has been to Israel with me three times uh, wow. Scotty's been with me once uh, or twice twice I think and uh, great 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 couple uh, know them extremely well and um, <clears throat> when Pamela was just up there visiting, your wife, uh, she got to sit down and, and fellowship with two of my closest friends, a family that uh, their, their, son, their daughter um, uh, and her husband are expecting, and uh, I will be the honorary grandfather of that child. And so, you know, here's this world where uh, years ago, you didn't know you and I didn't know each other. I didn't. Milton, Milton Florida, had no idea what it was, and um, we launched this program. You and I get connected, and all of a sudden, our worlds begin to collide, and yes. it's a family reunion. And it's really, really quite wonderful uh, what God is doing. Uh, yeah. and, and my daughter lives 20 minutes away, uh, 20, 25 minutes away from you, so. I always know that if there's a, uh, you can get there faster than I can, and I've got no the, doubt, and I've got no the, doubt. got the phone number. So uh, tell me, give me an update because there's been uh, so much going on. Uh, we we have in the current situation with the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus situation we're facing, but that's just a symptom uh, that's allowing us to look beneath the surface at how global entities are finding cooperation, unity, proposals for uh, technology changes, uh, the uh, idea of a chip, a mark, a, a global government, uh, tracking systems, just a whole lot of things thrown into the mix that uh, seem to be seemingly unrelated, but all deal with the setting uh, yeah. for, for the stage for yes. Arm Armageddon. Listen, there can be no doubt that the COVID-19 global pandemic, they call it, this virus, has medical, biological, scientific elements, of course, health elements. I mean, that's obvious. But there are, as you just said, political, geopolitical, prophetic, and, and 
and end times. And of course, that ties in with the prophetic, but not just prophetic, but end times implications. It, it has all of this. Why? Because we are the first generation in the history of the planet and the history and since the time of the birth of the church to see a couple of things happen we are the first generation to be living in the age of instantaneous global information and communication systems no generation before us has had this ability internet cell phones instantaneous video news information communication and and in the midst of that is a is a is a whole lot of fakery, a whole lot of masquerading. You see what I did? That cheap plug for my book. Masquerade. I wrote this book months and months ago. It came out just a few weeks ago. It came out in the middle of the COVID crisis. I knew any knew nothing about COVID coming when I wrote it, but yet it prophesies, the book does, I mean, without trying to be a, prof, you know, uh, I never call myself a prophet, but, but it certainly forecasted exactly what we went in uh, what we're in now so so with the first generation to see that happen of uh, we went to bed one night thinking the next day was going to be pretty much the same kind of life in our world and in uh, and around the globe we woke up the next day literally and then of course it developed over days but that next day the whole world had changed the philosophical uh, outlook had changed. The politically correct speak had changed. The nations coming together with plans and fears and panic over a so-called epidemic and pandemic. And the next thing you know, the world begins to shut down its citizens and take away its rights summarily in the name of peace and safety. I mean, good gosh, that comes right out of the scriptures. Right. The whole world overnight. So, so there's that element the second element that is unprecedented is that for the first time in history since the birth of the church, and of course before it, it doesn't matter because we're talking about the church, since the birth of the church in 2,000 years, that the entire globe on Resurrection Sunday, you could not find a church to go to. Now, now there are exceptions. My church has been open from day one, and I haven't shut it yet. And I can talk about the caveats of that in a moment. I haven't broken any laws. We're perfectly healthy. We've had not one infection, not one death. We've worshipped right on, um, and we've taken a lot of precautions. But the Lord is blessing. We're in a low-risk area down here, statistically speaking. So, But all the churches around us are closed. Nobody mm -hmm. told them to. Nobody ordered them to. They just did it. And such is the same around the world. Now, in a lot of nations, the governments have strict control over the people, and they just ordered that the churches be shut down. You know, this, this, was, uh, this was wonderful for China, and I don't mean to be ugly about this, but they hate Christians anyway. And, and their church is the government church anyway, the underground church. The people like you and me, we would have to worship underground if we were in China. And of course, I bet you that they kept meeting as always. They've always had to meet in secret. Uh, but And they may have put restrictions on themselves because that seemed to be the epicenter of this outbreak. And I'm sure people were terrified. But but the point is, all over the globe. And, and, and forget the globe. Let's talk about the largest most independent, free, and powerful constitutional republic the planet has ever seen. And please hear me. I, I, I want to complete all of this because I don't want people thinking I'm being judgmental here. I, I'm not because there are cases where this needs to be done. But by and large, overnight, churches shuttered their doors, most of them voluntarily. And, and pastors shut the churches down. And denominations shut their churches down all over the nation. And, and the ones that did have, a, you know, say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't just summarily dismiss the First Amendment. And those of us that were in, uh, uh, um, um, you know, safe, safer, much safer, low-risk zones for infection or deaths, um, you know, those of us that did keep our church doors open, we are now persecuted by fellow believers, fellow pastors, fellow denominations, I'm talking about evangelical pastors and, and so-called Christians and denominations, um, they, they're persecuting us on social media, they're persecuting us in the media, around the nation. Pastors are turning in pastors to the law, churches are turning other churches over to the law, just like Jesus said in the very last days, brother would turn against brother, sister against sister, they would even deliver each other unto death. 
I'm sure that's going on around the world in communist countries where Christians are meeting and people are turning even family members into the government because they're so afraid they're going to die of the COVID-19 virus. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are the two things. We went to bed one night. The next morning, the whole world had changed. No, no generation before us could that have happened in. The spirit of antichrist, the spirit of fear, the spirit of anti-church, the spirit of anti-word of God has spread around the globe. I tell my folks around here, my people at my church love this, but the people in our community hate me for saying it because it's the truth. I say, isn't it hypocritical? Isn't it ungodly? Isn't it antichrist spirit? that the people in our own region down here will look at churches like mine and say, you are evil. You're, you're, you're so unsafe. You're helping to spread the virus. We, we haven't had a single person in our congregation of many hundreds, not a single one has been diagnosed with COVID. I'm not bragging or being, I'm humble before the Lord on this. This is God's protection. Right. We prayed for this for years before this ever happened. And that's a another whole story. I was preaching and teaching on the Philadelphia church, the protection of the Philadelphia church when the testing came upon the world. And we've been praying that God would protect us and preserve us in the midst of those kinds of testings. And here's one of them. And, and, and the Philadelphia church says, basically, because you have not closed your doors, because you have not shut down the gospel, because you, you, you honor my name when others won't, you honor my word, I will protect you in the midst of the testing that is going to come upon the world. So what has happened, I tell my folks, and the, as I said, people around here don't like me because of it, but I say, isn't it interesting? Uh, Hickory Hammock, our church, we shut down everything except for Sunday morning worship. And we told the community, our doors are open. We've got a big sanctuary. A lot of our people won't come because they can't come. They're, some of them are elderly. Some of them have underlying health conditions. And we got a lot of young people and young couples in our church, too, and most of them are here. Some of our elderly, very, we've got a lot of very healthy elderly people, and, and they're there. Uh, but we, we have a Sunday morning worship. We've got plenty of room in our sanctuary for people to spread out on their own. We put hand sanitizer everywhere. We've got good ventilation systems. We, we spray, we use, you know, disinfectants, Lysol and everything behind and in front of people coming in and leaving. We do all of these things. We keep the place clean and scrubbed. Then we've cut out all small group meetings. We've cut out Sunday night worship, Wednesday night worship, uh, Bible, uh, you know, uh, Sunday school classes in smaller rooms. We've cut all that out. We've got a Sunday morning worship. Plus, we use our choir suite. We stream the service into there so that people want to separate further they can. We use our fellowship hall where we stream an, the service into there and more people can go over there. Plus, we stream live to the world and we tell our people. Do not come if you don't want to. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to judge you. We're not a cult. We don't make people come to the church. I'm not standing up in the pulpit defying the law. There is no law against us meeting. The governor actually, in his order in Florida, he said churches were essential services and that people could go to church without any fear of the law. Um, he said that pastors are essential infrastructure personnel and that we may move around freely as long as we're in the process of ministering to people. And so, we, I'm, I'm, man, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. I know the same has not happened in Alabama, but it has happened in Florida. And so, but in the midst of that, these same Christians from other churches, brother, who are trashing us because a couple of hundred people, now we have many hundreds that come to church, but now we don't, because some of ours are staying at home watching live stream and we're spreading out. But because a couple of hundred people meet in a sanctuary that holds 700, so there's plenty of room to spread out now, for one hour we worship the Lord, those same people that are trashing us will on Sundays go hang out at Walmart for hours among thousands of people, they'll go over to Home Depot and Lowe's and buy fishing clubs and azalea plants to plant and golf clubs at Walmart. But then they, that's fine, they say. That's fine if they do that. But if we meet for one hour and worship the Lord, we are evil. And these are other Christians, Brother Eric. So this is what I'm telling you. This is unprecedented. And in the midst of all of this happening, 
a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about this on my radio show. I don't have the references right in front of me, but your audience can Google it. They'll see I'm telling the truth. Um, Gordon Brown, the ex-prime minister of Great Britain, in the midst of all of this, called for a global government, his words, a global government to ensure peace and safety across the globe when pandemics like this happen and, and world events change, that we need a global government and we need a person who's the head of this global government. He was literally saying that right out of the pages of Scripture, Brother Eric. And then, at the same time, the New York Times published an opinion piece on their opinion page, and it wasn't a write-in letter, it was an actual article. And the headline was that evangelical Christians are responsible for the global pandemic of COVID. That brought chills to my spine because that reminded me of Nero when Rome was on fire, and many historians now believe he was responsible for that. He blamed the Christians. Well, New York is the epicenter in the United States. All of those international airports, all of those people from China and Italy that were coming in and out by the tens of thousands all during January, February, March, December, when this was going on before they finally shut it down. And now they're the epicenter, they're ground zero for infections and deaths. And they blame it on the Christians, not the fact that there's millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people living in a tight little city with international airports and international travelers that had poured in there by the tens of thousands for months. Oh no, that's not to blame. Who's to blame? The Christians are to blame. So all of this is happening, brother. All of it has prophetic implications. I'm not saying that this is that. In other words, I'm not saying that that this is the ultimate fulfillment of the scriptures. But at the very least, it's a microcosm of how these things can happen how they are happening, how they are going to happen in the last days. And I tell Christians that say, well, do you think this is the Great Tribulation? Do you think this is the exact time before? Well, I say, look, I, I don't set dates. or and it, it's, it's, a, it's a viral infection, and it's, a, it's an epidemic. Um, and, it, and it should, by all rights, by, by the way all viruses work, it should pass. And hopefully we can get some some uh, some vaccines hopefully we can get some medications like tamiflu for the flu and the you know the flu vaccines vaccinations and things you know and and so but in the meantime in the meantime people evil people the masters of the universe satan the demonic realm gods and thrones i wrote a book about this paul wrote a book about it it's called ephesians chapter 6 our battles not against flesh and blood we see the virus in flesh and blood we see the governments in flesh and blood we watch the lockdowns and the overreach of governmental authorities on christians and just citizens of countries around the world we see that in the flesh and blood but behind it all is satan he is moving towards bringing his antichrist kingdom and now he has watched pastors and Christians scramble for the corners, shutter their doors, cower in fear, some of them, uh, not all of them, uh, some of them under government orders and edicts, some of them blindly obeying, uh, others of them that didn't obey, not only did they get arrested and persecuted by the government, but fellow Christians trashed them and, rest and, and persecute them as well. This is all prophetic stuff. Um, I think we're in the very edges of watching this Antichrist system burst forth. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime or not, but it's it's getting close, brother, and we're living in the midst of a microcosm of exactly how it works. The view that most people have had is that the rise of the Antichrist is going to be this um, son of perdition, this, this man of lawlessness, but we also read when the words were spoken <clears throat> that there are already antichrists in the world. That's correct. That, that the one who's, n the number of his name will equal 666 in the Hebrew language. That will be the one who will make a covenant with many. Uh, but there are many antichrists, and there are many who have an anti-Christian agenda. If there's 2.2 billion Christians, that means there's 5 billion non-Christians, uh, we are the minority. And if there is a way to control uh, this uh, 
really disobedient minority that's not willing to go with the status quo of the whatever the government policies are. Uh, we are the rebellious body. We are the rebellious arm of it. But uh, it is wonderful that we've had an influence on Washington, but should that change, the whole game changes. Yes. Everything yes. changes. It changes, and it can happen overnight. And you know what, brother? You talked about, that was brilliant what you did, 2.2 billion Christians. That means there's 5 billion or more that are not Christians. Well, in the, in the most fundamental definition, then those 5 billion would have the spirit of Antichrist. Correct. In, in the fundamental devil. I'm not making them out to be the devil or demons. I'm no. just saying that they are opposed to the Christ. They are opposed to the gospel. They are opposed to the word of God and to, and to the church of God. And, so, and, and, and the foundation for what you're saying, and I want to make sure people know this is straight from the Bible. Jesus yes. said, if you are not for me, you are against me. Against me, me. anti-Christ. Right. So, yes. so, so it, that's it, it, it's a clear. It's a very clear position to take. Yes. Is we're not saying that this person is demonic. We're not saying. We're just saying that according to Scripture, if you are not for Jesus, you are anti-Jesus. You are anti-Christ. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. So the point I'm making on that foundation that you set, and then I started expounding upon is that 2.2 billion, you say, well, that's still a lot of people. Yeah, but let's use the United States as a microcosm because we are the largest Christian nation on the planet right now. Now, China's right behind us, but, but they're underground, <laughs> you know. So let's, we're the largest nation, the Christian nation on the planet. And, and when we hear that, we think, wow, that's great, that's great. Not really, not really. In fact, it ought to send shudders down our spine. Why? So the largest Christian nation doesn't know what a marriage is. The largest Christian nation doesn't know what a gender is. The largest Christian nation doesn't know what the sanctity of the womb is. The largest Christian, I mean, I could go on and on with this. I don't know. We may be the largest Christian nation, but what does that mean? All right, statistically, according to all the latest polls, Pew poll, uh, 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 George Barna, here's what's happened. 20 years ago, if you polled, uh, took any hundred people off the street in a, in a, in a, in a sampling, I mean, don't, don't go into some uh, atheist uh, community, commune, but if you just go into the streets, take a, take a relative sampling, line up a hundred people and ask them, what faith would you define yourself as? 20 years ago, 90% would say Christian. And all they really meant by that, we have discovered, is I'm not an atheist, I'm not an agnostic, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Buddhist, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not a Hindu, I, I am a Christian. Well, why? Well, because I'm an American. <laughs> you know, that's what, I'm an American, you know, <laughs> like George Bush, American. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu, I'm a Christian. Okay, so 90%. Now, if you ask that same 100 people 20 years later, it's right at 70%. It's dropped 20%. Now, in the last 20 years, what's happened? Well, 9-11, uh, open borders, uh, all kinds of refugees and immigrants coming into our nation, Somalians. Uh, now we've got Muslim cities and conclaves all over the United States. The FBI is tracking ISIS cells, killer cells, sleeper cells in all 50 states, according to mainstream media. So uh, the demographics are changing, have changed and are changing. So now you ask, and they 70 of percent of 70 of the hundred but watch George Barna just a few months back completed his poll and I put it I think it's in masquerade if it's not a masquerade it's in gods of the final kingdom but he asked that remaining 70 percent okay how many of you have a biblical worldview now that's the only thing he said he said some little caveat in other words you believe that the Christian life ought to be lived from uh, a, a literal and contextual interpretation of the Bible. That 70% figure fell to 40%. Now watch, it gets worse. Then when he asked the remaining 40%, he said, now, how many of you believe that 
living a a, a biblically uh, biblical worldview, um, it, it, it means that marriage is between a man and a woman. It means Israel has a right to exist. It means prophecy is happening in our day. It means, you know, and he goes through these things that you and I talk about all the time, a biblical worldview. It fell then, out of any hundred people, it fell to less than 10%. So we might have 70% saying, Lord, Lord. But Matthew 7, Jesus said, not everybody who just says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, not everybody who just says, Lord, Lord, is a Christian. They are not born again. Not everybody. I'm not the judge of that. I'm not being judgmental here. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. I'm telling you what Americans are saying. I'm telling you what George Barnapole is saying. And so what we've got, brother, we say there's 2.2 billion Christians. There's not anything even close to that of born-again, Bible-believing Christians who come from a biblical worldview. Because Jesus said not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Watch. But he who does the will of my Father. What's that? Stand in the word, contextually. Exalt Jesus without shame, without fear. Claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And, t and, and tell people... We know what a marriage is because God says it. Jesus says it. Have you not heard? Matthew 19, verse 4. Have you not heard from the beginning God made them male and female? For this reason the man will leave his parents and marry his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I mean, these kinds of things. But 90% of the 70% who say they're Christians, 90% of Americans who say that say, we don't believe that. So you get down to 10%, brother. We are, in the last days, a very small minority of the world's population, which is exactly what Jesus said. He didn't say the whole world was going to come to him before, before he returned. He said the whole world was going to hear the gospel, and then he was going to come. But he didn't say that everybody was going to turn to the gospel. No, he makes it very clear in the parable of the virgin, Matthew 25. He said, look... <clears throat> Here's the deal. Okay. You gotta be you gotta be ready. He says, therefore keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. This is a clarion call for us to be prepared. A clarion right. call for us not to be what? Out buying toilet paper. That's see when I heard this everybody this run on toilet paper. Yeah. It jumped into my spirit, Matthew twenty five. These people, it's too late. He's, he's already letting people in. They, the, the ones who had toilet paper were in. Okay? Yeah. The ones who didn't, he said, later the others came and said, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Okay? Right. right. Why, why was the world, why was America so concerned about toilet paper brother we 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 are like we are like sheep i mean the bible says that and 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 that's why you hear this little it's it's meant as a as an uh, um uh, oh it, it's meant as an insult yeah that that americans are sheeple right <laughs> yeah we are so so with social media and immediate interaction and communication through the internet people hear, oh, you better get toilet paper, you better get water, and people think, oh, that's right, that's right, I'm going to get, and then they take pictures of themselves, videos of themselves, and they go into Walmart, and the next thing you know, everybody's like, I got to get my toilet paper before somebody else gets it, and this entitlement, this selfishness, this, this irrationality, this depravity of mind, it sweeps the culture. Even born-again believers were rushing down to Walmart and fighting other people over a roll of toilet paper. I just, I said, guys, first of all, you should have already had some toilet paper. Number two, go down and just buy some. Don't be beating people up over toilet paper. Number three, if you run completely out, if you have a rag and some running water, you've got toilet paper. I, I hate to be gross here, but I mean, what do you think people do without toilet paper all over the world? It's not, you're not going to die if you don't have toilet paper. But you will die forever if you're not under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you, you will die in this world if you, if you don't have food and water and, and some shelter. 
Those are the things. But no, they're running for toilet paper. I, I'm, I'm telling you, brother, to me, that was almost a, a parody of our culture and, and who we are. That the thing we're the most concerned about is wiping ourselves. I, I just, brother, <laughs> I, I'm not trying to be funny and I'm not trying to be crude. I mean, everybody does it, right? So, but but you you ask the question. So so we watch this panic, and that transferred over into this unnatural, ungodly, demonic fear. Oh my God, we're all gonna die. Well, wait a minute. God has not given you, my sister, my brother, that spirit of fear, but God has given us the spirit of, of power and love and of a sound mind. Well, where does that come from? From the Holy Spirit. Where, where does panic and fear come? From an unholy spirit. It is demonic. So, so that begins to sweep. The next thing you know, it goes all over social media. Well, you, we shouldn't be gathering in churches. And the next thing you know, churches, yeah, yeah, that's right. And they start shutting their doors before anybody asks them. Now, you know the evil people are watching this, Eric. The masters of the universe, Satan, they're watching Christians, the people that sing about my victories in Jesus, my Savior. Faith, yes, faith, amen. Do you have faith? Yes. If you have faith, you can move mountains. Amen. By faith, God can heal you. Hey, preach it, brother, preach it. And then COVID comes, and all of these faith people run for the hills. I'm telling you what my prayer is, brother. And I know I'm taking a earthly, physical, fleshly chance here, but I don't think so spiritually I am because God knows my heart. But I'm going to say something. At the church that I pastor, we kept our doors open by faith. We've been preaching faith, living faith for all of these decades together. We're not arrogant about it. We're humble about it. We are humbly fearful before the Lord about it. Reverently fearful knowing that we are not any more special than anybody else. We do not deserve for God to completely protect us. But we have prayed, and for years I have preached and taught. You walk in the Lord. You, you go where God tells you. You do what He tells you to do, and you say what He tells you to say, and He will bless you for it. He will honor you for it. Psalm 1 says that. And, and, and all through the Scriptures into the New Testament. So now here we are in the midst of a global crisis, We've kept our doors open, and our prayer has been, Lord, not for our protection physically, not for our pride, but for your word to be proven true. Would you just protect us while we show the world? We will use our heads. We will wash our hands. We will spread people out. We will have one morning worship service. We will not poke an eye, poke a finger in the eye of Satan. Right. But we will come before our Heavenly Father in faith and say, Lord, we're going to keep the doors open. We're going to sing your praises. We're going to preach the gospel. Would you please protect us? We've been doing this since it all started in January. Here we are. We are blessed. We are protected. The gospel is going out. We're one of the few churches open. And I'm telling you, evil people are watching all of this, Eric. That's the thing. This is so prophetic. Never has a generation on the planet since the birth of the church never has a generation seen anything like this. Listen, listen, yesterday, while I'm preaching resurrection services at our church, I, I mentioned the fact that in Kentucky, you've probably already talked about this, the governor, by edict, shut down any kind of worship service. He said you can't have car churches, you know, where you drive up, you can't meet, you can't meet outside, you can do nothing except maybe stream over line, uh, online if you have the equipment and the money and the, and, and, and the personnel and if there's good bandwidth and if the internet doesn't shut you down and if you have a Facebook account and if you have a YouTube account. That's the only way. Well, brother, th there were churches that denied that unconstitutional, ungodly, antichrist spirit order. And they were fine. They, the governor said, we're going to send state police around to the churches. We will arrest. We will ticket $500 fine on the spot for anybody caught in a car church. They went to one church in Kentucky where people were in their cars, families in their cars. So it was not against the law for that family to drive around in that car and go to Walmart and get groceries or to buy fishing poles so they could go fishing. But if you drove that same car with that same family into a parking lot, you never got out of your car, 
but you worship Jesus Christ with other people who are parked there listening to a preacher over a loudspeaker, you are breaking the law and they find you and they arrested the preacher. That's in Kentucky, United States of America, brother. This is what I'm telling you. This is unprecedented. It is illegal. It is ungodly. It is antichrist. Satan is behind it. The evil people, the masters of the universe and governments of the world are watching this. If it can happen in America, if it can happen in the Bible Belt, it can happen anywhere on this planet. And Satan's getting ready to pull that string very soon. Amen. Amen. Pastor Carl Gallup, author of the new book, Masquerade, talking about what's going on around us, big government, power, authority. The bottom line is, is that you decide on who you will submit to. And the book of Romans tells us that all authority is God appointed. But if what you're being asked to do is in conflict with what God asks you to do, then he is sovereign and he is the ultimate authority. We need to be obedient to him first and foremost. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to talk a little bit about masquerade. Prepare for the greatest con job in history. A lot of this con job is being played out yes. right now on your TV. Yes but just not on this channel. Yes. We're going to be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www. Dot .ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel. But nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash event. 
Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Carl Gallops, author of the new book, Masquerade, Prepare for the Greatest Con Job in History. He joins us here on the second Monday of every month at 12 o'clock and for a second special edition on the last Thursday of each month or the fourth Thursday of each month at 11 a.m. for Carl Gallup's version two, or we just did two because we run out of time, and I just got tired after two years of running out of time, so we had another hour. And, uh, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, You're so kind, brother. Well, I appreciate it. Well, are you trying to say I talk too much? What are you trying no, to say? No, I'm trying to say that uh, together <laughs> we get we get great feedback. That uh, sure sure wish you guys did more together. And, okay. Uh, well, let's do it then, brother. So, so we're doing it. <laughs> uh, so take us on a little journey through Masquerade. Okay, I, I will. Appreciate it. Yeah, listen, gods and thrones, gods of ground zero, and gods of the final kingdom. I, my publishers call that the gods trilogy. Right. Um, Masquerade really is the fourth of all of that. We just changed the title. Of, you know, we didn't want to run a good thing in the ground. You know, <laughs> what was this going to be the gods of? But, but all of them, I, I tell your listeners, you do not have to read them in any order. They're all written to stand alone. They deal with certain topics, and you know how I write. Genesis to Revelation, I connect the scriptures. I don't hone in on a theme right. and just make the Bible say what I want it to say. I deal with the, the contextual outpouring of, of the Word of God, and I deal with stuff that have, have kinds of topics and things that have long been ignored, ignored by the modern American church. Uh, the classical church understood these things because you can go back to the classical scholars and they write about these things. They write about the supernatural and the connections uh, throughout the scriptures. They just took it for granted that the word of God was speaking truly. <laughs> when when Paul said in Ephesians 6 um, that, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, there really are other dimensions of reality. Yeah. There really is a demonic realm that really does influence our lives, our churches, our governments. They took that literally and seriously and wrote at length about it, tying scriptures together. So what I've done is try to restore this classical understanding of the Word of God, this biblical contextual understanding. I go all the way back to the first century and find out what the early fathers knew about it, because they're the ones that were either related to the first disciples, or some of them were the actual first disciples and their disciples who were writing about what Jesus taught directly to them. And so in my writings, all of these, the God series and Masquerade, which is really the fourth one, what I try to do is just unwrap some of the deep mysteries and truths of God's Word, put them in a way that everybody that's a born-again believer can grasp it, can understand it, and then not only is it a teaching, because I want, you know, the Bible says to sh study to show yourself approved so you can right. accurately handle the Word of God, but more importantly is to take that teaching then and move it into our life to apply it, not only that, but into the headlines, into the world we're living in and into the prophetic line upon which we are traveling. And so I try to write, as you know, my books, I, they're, they're, each chapter is about five pages, six, seven pages at the most. Um, I, I try to write in a conversational style like you and I are speaking right now, but I have everything backed up with plenty of scholarly research, word studies. Um, I don't get really PhD academic with anything. I want everybody to be able to get this, but a PhD can, can go there and then follow my reference notes to the end, and in the end notes, there's another book back there, basically, with it goes even deeper and, and, and even more into the academia of it. So the bottom line is, when you're reading the books, I take you right in to the third person. I put you on the shores of Galilee. You, you, it's like reading a novel. You, you get to hear the conversations between Jesus and the Pharisees, and Jesus and the and 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 the lame man and and Jesus and the guy with the withered hand in the synagogue and masquerade I take you right into the synagogues I, I, I it's like you're there I mean you know uh, the Lord enabled me to do this but but you can taste it you can smell it you can feel it and you hear Jesus speak and the reaction you see the reaction of the Pharisees you see and feel the utter 
unbelief and weeping and, and, and thankfulness of the man whose hand was healed right there, but then the outrage towards Jesus because of it. You walk along the shores, you watch the healings, you hear the teaching, you gather on the shores in Matthew 13, that night or the next night when Jesus is right before sundown, he, ta- he lays out seven kingdom parables in a row. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and brother, he is looking right at the Pharisees when he's speaking most of it. He's looking right beyond them into the demonic realm, and he's speaking to Satan as well. He ties in last days prophecies of what's going to happen in the church in the last days, how the tares are planted among the wheat, but then the Lord comes and, d- and disperses them. But it is the enemy, it's Satan in the last days, who's going to pollute and pervert the church. We get into the New Testament, and what do we hear Paul say? The Spirit clearly says, in the last days, false prophets, false teachers, demonic spirits, people gathering teachers tickle their itching ears, the, the, the church being led astray. Uh, brother, so anyway, masquerade is about this whole big con job that Satan has been pulling on us since the Garden of Eden and since the flood and how he has ratcheted it up, his con job, in these last days because he knows his time is short, he is filled with rage, he hates God, he hates his throne, he wants to be the God of this planet and of this age, and he's working towards that end, and the Bible said he would. The Bible prophesied he would, and we're watching it happen right now as we're making this as we're live today, we're right in the middle of the whole COVID outbreak and the shutdown of churches by governments all over the world. We've just passed Resurrection Sunday, and you would be hard-pressed to find a church anywhere on the globe where the people congregated together and lifted up their praise to Jesus Christ on Resurrection Sunday. And you know why? Because that was Satan's death nail. He is now lashing out. Just like he's been lashing out against the womb of the woman that brought forth the seed, Abortion is the number one cause of death on the planet and has been for decades. We lose 60 million children a year. That's how many people we lost in the entirety of World War II. There is a World War II Holocaust that happens every single year on the globe and nobody cares. And Satan is attacking the womb of the woman and the seed of the womb of the woman. And now he's attacking the church on Resurrection Sunday. He shuts it down, but with a virus that becomes a pandemic and then the governments he pulls the strings and pushes the buttons and convinces and convinces world leaders church leaders to shut down the church and then to persecute any pastor or Christian who keeps their church open brother if this is not prophetic I don't know what is and this is where we're living this is what masquerade talks about it peels back all kinds of layers of Satan's lies who Satan really is what demons can and cannot do who demons really are who Satan really is what powers he has what powers he doesn't have it talks not only about the major hooks that Satan's going to use in the last days pornography drug addiction all of these different things but it gives deliverance there are actually chapters where you can work self deliverance in your life as though a person came into my office and sat down and said pastor I think I'm demonically infested I think I'm demonically being manipulated I need some help I need to be delivered I need I I, I need to get set free what do I do well I write a couple of chapters as though you had come into my office, the reader had come into my office, as here's what you pray, here's the attitude of your heart, here are the scriptures that you claim, here's the word that you claim, here's what you do next, here's the support system you build around you, here's where you go, here's what you do. It's all right there in the book. So it's so not only is it a teaching book, but parts of it read like a novel, and it puts you there so you can feel it, taste it, touch it, smell it. And not only that, but it points to the headlines and what's happening and and pulls back the curtain on what's actually happening. And not only that, there are chapters like a manual that gives you the solution and helps you to effect that solution, not only in your own life, but let's say you're reading this and you don't have a drug addiction or a pornography addiction, but you know somebody who does. Everybody has somebody in their life who's addicted to these things and is destroying their lives. And so, you can equip yourself to minister to them. You can give this book to them 
to minister to them. So that's what it's basically about. That's what I wrote it for. I, 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 I the, listen. Pat Boone wrote the forward to it. Um, he read the manuscript. He and I have become friends. I'm not name dropping, but we just have, and and over the years, and um, and he is. Uh, he wrote the forward. He read it, and he said, I, "I please, can I write the forward to this?" I said, "Sure." So it's it, it's a good book. Not not because I'm, I'm a good writer, but but the the topic, what God gave me, the way it fits together. It's a good book. It's ministering to a lot of people all over the world. You know, one but, of the things that, things I found about the book was that not only does it identify um, what to do in this area, let's say, of self-deliverance, but also what gateways do you have open where you're allowing things to enter in? What, what, what small things, what adjustments do you need to make? Are, are you um, um, oh, a crack in the door? You have a leak in your house. Uh, there's, there's a... Uh, yeah. uh, um, a window open. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and what you need to do to, to take inventory of yeah. how you're living and whether or not you're allowing strongholds or you're breaking strongholds. And so if you right. identify one, now you have some practical ways in which you can address them biblically. Uh, yes. And so it becomes a, uh, um, an expose on what the Bible reveals as Satan's agenda, yes. his tactics, how he plans to carry it out, and then what you can do as an antidote to it to insulate and inoculate yourself and your family so that yeah. you're walking on the right side. Uh, right. When this dividing line comes, and it's coming, we're seeing it come in a lot of ways, um, but uh, in in this particular case, uh, you know, there's things that we overlook. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. It, it, I, I know we're running out of time. Can I have another three or four minutes to unwrap something, or did you want to go somewhere else with this? No, you got mean, you got about uh, one minute, and I'll give I'll give you a minute and a half. Okay, it won't be enough time to what I wanted to do, so it's no problem. It's my fault, but <laughs> but I, I don't even want to un, start unpacking it. But there's several chapters in there that help people to understand Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, the way. What? Well, then let's do that on the Carl Gallup's Hour 2 on, okay. on the Thursday. The, the, let's do. The, on the, uh, yeah. and, and the thing is, that I'll just say this very quickly. What we're watching happening now is an exact picture of what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 said would happen in its proper context. What Jesus said, what Paul really said about it, and what the scholars for the last 1900 years, the vast majority of them, understood it to mean, we are now living in it. It has been misinterpreted, misaligned, and I, we set it straight. And, 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 and so I can't wait to talk about it in that second hour. Right. I made a note that in the April 23rd at 11 a.m. we're going to talk about, we're going to open with Second Thessalonians chapter 2 for that. Thanks. We've been Thanks. talking with Carl Gallops, pastor, minister, a senior pastor at Hickory Hammock, Baptist Church, prolific author, and good friend. You can find out more about him at carlgallops.com. New book, Masquerade, Prepare for the Greatest Con Job in History with a Ford by Pat Boone. Carl Gallops, so great to see you, my brother. I will see you, you. on the 23rd, 10 days from now at 11 o'clock. will be the next time you're with us to talk about 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2. And then what that's led into, because that's opened up a whole wide swath of uh, theology that we can talk about <clears throat> in general as to uh, the various avenues of thinking uh, that that passage, that chapter has opened. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Rabbi you. Eric. God bless I love you, my friend. Brother. I love you too. We're going to take a short break, <clears throat> and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 